Hey everyone, welcome to Commander and Coffee, the podcast where all creatures have vigilance and haste. My name is Y. And I'm Cork. Hey, what's up? It's Cypher. So the topic of today is Shorakai Genesis Engine. Cork is going to be leading this discussion, but before we go into that, I'm going to mention today's coffee. It is a coffee that I made at 8 o'clock this morning in the middle of a campground. It is the Onyx Coffee Tanzanian Blend. It's got a really cool body to it. Um, it's got like fruity notes, black tea notes. Uh, we all drank it black. It wasn't my call, but everyone enjoyed it. So that's the coffee, and now we'll go into the deck. Lead us off, Cork. All right, so Shorakai here. For those of you that don't know, uh, Shorakai Genesis Engine is two white blue uh, for an 8 8 legendary artifact creature vehicle. <clears throat> or, I'm sorry, artifact vehicle. Uh, it has the ability of one and tap it to draw two cards, then discard a card. And then you create a 1 1 colorless pilot creature token uh, with this creature cruise vehicles as though its power was two more and it has a an ability of crew eight but i'm going to tell you now it's not what we're using it for we're not crewing this bad boy this this mech is going to stay exactly as it is so this was one of my favorite creatures when it came out um in the kamigawa set one, one in the commander set i uh, I built it quite a few different ways until I finally settled on the list that I'm going off of now, uh, which is actually a polymorph list, uh, because you can leverage the pilots that you get from Shorakai as the polymorph target to then polymorph into one of the tyrants and you go from there. Uh, The other unique thing that I noticed with Shorakai is it's one of the biggest things that Blue-White was always missing is card draw in the command zone. Um, Arbiter was always good because it lessened the cost of things. Lavinia, again, huge stacks piece. But it was always seemed to be missing that card draw there. And a way to close out the game. Yeah, and also a way to close out the game with those two, yeah. Uh, so the biggest draw to me for Shorakai was it, it could be a control deck while leveraging, leveraging cards like Humility and Certain Removal. Uh, and the, Like I said, the primary game plan was to polymorph into... Uh, one of the tyrants, whether it be Holebreaker Horror or Tide Spot Tyrant, and then finish up with a com- uh, with one of those combos or an Ice uh, Scepter, Dramatic Dr- Reversal combo. So what are some things that like you think this deck does the best, better than the other blue-white decks, other than just having that game-winning text on it? So the biggest thing is it's amazing card draw in the command zone. Draw two, ditch one, like, phenomenal. Uh, another big thing is one of my favorite cards, Humility, and it's unaffected by it because it's an artifact. It's not a creature. And as the game progresses, because you get those pilots, because you get those two cards, you get to see more cards than your opponents, and you get incremental advantage as the game goes on. And the other really cool thing is you get to run those white, uh, blue-white silver bullets that just you know tend to stop people out of nowhere. I think this commander really seems to kind of check all the boxes for you, Cork. When I when I saw you playing it, even from the very start, because you've you've been on this deck, you've been testing it for a little bit now. Uh, you took it to at least one event, right? You took it to the two headed event, um, a little bit different context, but um, you did. I feel that you have a lot of success because it's such a unique property of a commander in that it's a non creature. It does the stacks, the elements, and the control elements that you seem to like a lot. And I feel like you like Planeswalker Commanders, you just don't like the ones that are currently out. So this kind of seems to scratch that itch for you, in my opinion. Yeah, it, it really does. It's having that, uh, you know, that uniqueness in the command zone, and it fills the role of the stacks. But it also harkens back to the days when I first started playing Magic and learning how to play. And um, a lot of you guys actually paired me up and had me play uh, with Esper Control and Jeskai Control and you know, blue white spirit control, like so this hits all my like nostalgic feels too, which I think is really cool for me. A uh, couple things that I don't like about it, you know, um I always say what's your biggest fear with a deck? Like what's the deck's biggest fear? And a hundred percent the biggest fear in this deck is null rod effects. Makes sense. Collector oof, null rod, um anything that prevents me from using my artifacts because Unfortunately, it's blue-white. It's going to be using a lot of artifacts. 
Uh, another thing that's actually kind of scary for it uh, is actually Graft Digger's Cage, because it shuts off the polymorph lines. It uh, it also takes a bit for uh, Shorokai here to get some legs, but I'm... Boo. Boo. Yeah, I'll take that one. I deserve that one. Uh, but what I mean by that is it's not a turn one, turn two combo deck. Like, you, when you're playing this deck, you're looking to win... You're just looking to draw the game out to turn five, turn six, you know, or even have the game locked down by turn four, you know. If you can't get there, if there's a deck that's going to be faster than that, it's going to be, you know, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. But you actually get to run a lot of counter spells and removal packages that really help you get to that long game. And that's kind of like one of the classic stacks curses, isn't it? You have a deck that's coming in like very fast and very hard breaking down your house while you're trying to set up all the pieces so that that's nothing new and i feel like when you do get set up shorakai has a good way to leverage those um symmetric effects yeah it 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 also seems to play better into other people's stack stacks uh which i've noticed in a lot of games that i played um people are playing like roll off effects and I'm just there going, yeah, I'm just going to make as many pilots and just beat you down with pilots. Cause I only need to count, cast one spell. That's fine by me. Yeah. It shuts off the, you know, my tyrant lines, but I'm okay with that. Or even my ice crown uh, scepter lines. But again, I'm totally okay with that because I'll just keep making pilots. So the funny thing with this deck that, that you guys have mentioned that, that, that I don't know if, if it's just for verbiage or if I just disagree with it, I don't look at Shorakai as a stacks deck. There's not a lot of, like, stacks elements in here. It definitely just feels like a blue-white control deck with a, with a, like, your standard big finisher in the form of your Holebreaker Horror and your Tide Spout, but instead of playing the old-school way of trying to get to, you know, what, seven or eight mana, you're just, you're just polymorphing that into play as quickly as you can. Yeah, it's, in my opinion, it's a different form of stacks. Um, control is, you know, it, it really stacks with people out. It's not leveraging a Thorn of Amethyst or a um, Winter Orb or something like that. It's leveraging uh, the three counter spells that I have or a Swords Plowshares or a Board Wipe or something like that to kind of really gain incremental advantage over the top of my opponents. Unlike a stack stick that has to be actively putting the stacks piece down going, yeah, I'm going to sit here and hopefully that Thorn of Amethyst really shuts you down, or Trinisphere, but like in my opinion, this plays better with stacks decks. Yeah, because this deck is this deck is way more reactive than it is proactive, right? And in, in the stacks deck, you're trying to slam a rule of law, you're trying to slam a, 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 a tax effect, something to that effect. In, in this deck, you just kind of want to get to Shorakai as quickly as you can, and then just sit and wait and then react to to the table either by counter spells or um through just continuing to just turn through turn through your deck with shorakai activations to to find your combo which i think is really cool so it this is definitely one of the in my opinion the, the the stronger control decks that's existed i know we've seen other control decks in the form of like curious control and rash me do its thing but the the card advantage that this deck can generate is actually pretty dope and, and, and i do like seeing that seeing in games like that where that's happening where you can just kind of react as opposed to having to play at source at snorcery speed um i i also feel that in cdh as a whole the lines between combo and control and stacks are a little bit more blurred than most other formats um just in the case that like all the decks if you're in blue and black you're pretty much on the thoracle combo um I think the biggest question is like choice of commander and when you are choosing to deploy certain threats. If you're trying for your commander fast early in the game or you're doing it later in the game, when you're deploying your counter spells and what you're countering. So I feel like, you know, if you've seen enough decks in the database, there's there's so much overlap, so much similarity. Um, and I think Shorakai is a good example of a lot of the cards are the same for blue white decks, but the way Shorakai deploys them. And what you're targeting, I, I feel, is quite a bit different than if you're playing something like a Grand Arbiter deck. That's that's what that's what I see. Like the neat the neat thing, which to to touch on your point that I saw is like it's like you know in your typical like you know your Turbo Grixis shells or your your blue black X shells, your your Tim Necron piles, what what have you. Your your counter spells are 
proactive are proactive first, reactive second. You, you really like to use those to protect your combo and, and, and when you're going for your win. Whereas I think in Shorkai, it's a little reversed, right? You're more or less stopping other people from winning, drawing some cards, gaining your card advantage, engines rolling, and then get to the point where you're like, all right, cool. Now that everyone's kind of you know, blown their load, done their thing. It's all done. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and 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 cast this this polymorph and, and go for the win here, which I think is really cool. Um, and a, and a little different different style of play. Yeah, because Shorikai does help you keep your hand full throughout the game at any time you want to invest the mana into it. Yeah, priority number one is always getting Shorikai down or humility. If it really boils down to it, uh, just depends on what else is at the table. We'll, we'll get into that a little later. So. Let me go into detail on some of the combos here. Uh, of course, you have naturally the Polymorph lines, which is Polymorph or Proteus Staff into whether it be Tidespout Tyrant or Holebreaker Horror. Uh, something unique that I found in Shorakai, uh, as opposed to like um, Urza, like Urza Polymorph, is I run both Tyrants. A lot of like the Urza lines, they came to the conclusion that one Tyrant. Uh, what, tyrant or horror, which mostly horror is the better one in that aspect, but I'm running both, um, which is, it worked better for me. It's a personal choice uh, because of another one of my combos in here, which we're going to get into in a little bit too, but it felt better because I didn't really care if I drew one because the thing is, I got enough mana where I could cast them at any time because I'm making that game last six seven eight turns i always want it to have mana with that tyrant loop you obviously go with a mana positive rock casting looping them between themselves uh and then once you get infinite mana you start looping shorikai into that and then drawing your deck until you get to blind obedience uh which then with blind obedience using its extort trigger you start looping the mana positive rocks and extorting it to kill the table so to clarify, so to do, in order to enact this um, polymorph line, Tide Spout Tyrant and Holebreaker Horror can be the only two creatures in your deck, correct? Correct. And then you're using the pilot tokens generated off of Shorakai in order to achieve that success. Correct. Neat. So how do you feel about how do you, how does you feel about having that deck building restriction of not being able to play um, some of the some of the more intricate creatures into the deck list? Uh, every time, multiple times, I have wanted to slam in uh, creatures such as like Ledger Shredder or Aven Mind Sensor multiple times over, or even Spell Seekers. I'm like, man, this will be great. This will help me get to my. Oh, I can't do that because you know creature. Um, so it was neat in that aspect, but then you found neat little um, other creatures or other things that function as a creature. So one of my favorite cards that I I found from the same deck, actually, is Imposter Mech. Uh, and what Imposter Mech does is it's one in a blue, and you may have Imposter Mech enter the battlefield as a copy of a creature and opponent controls, except it's a vehicle artifact with Crew 3 and loses all their card types, and it has the Crew 3 ability. What's really cool with that is, um, hey, you have a Seedborn on your side of the field? Cool, I'm going to Imposter Mech make a copy of that Seedborn, and then I'm going to kill your Seedborn or a Thrasios, or any type of value creature, because now I basically have an artifact with that ability of, you know, Seaborn, of Thrasios, of, uh, of Opposition Agent. Literally anything. And you have a commander that can possibly keep pace with a Seaborn deck. Exactly. Because of uh, Shorakite's ability is a tap ability, having a Seaborn use, or some type of untapper is phenomenal, because you just get so much more card advantage. And looking at your list, it does look like, as a whole, it's good that you don't have creatures, because I feel that you have a good number of unique cards, and just having those cuts in the creature base allows you to play a lot more other things. Like, I'm looking at your removal suite, which we're, looks like we're about to touch on that. Um, but yeah, just having like room for more board wipes and more um, unique interaction pieces and more stacks pieces, like your humilities, um, I think that cutting creatures for the polymorph option allows you to play to your other outs as well with your deck. Yeah, it definitely lets me uh, kind of shore up my other abilities with Shorakai. Um, that one was very good. 
Good job. <laughs> that one was better. Thanks. <laughs> uh, another thing that we have is like uh, why I mentioned humility. Shortcut's not affected by humility, so just humility beats. Sometimes it gets there. People don't ha- know how to deal with humility. Uh, I've played multiple games where they just went, yeah, humility's fine, and I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to keep pumping out creatures, p- uh, pilots, and swinging into you, and you're eventually going to have to block them. Oh, you know, you're blocking and I'm gaining more advantage because I don't care if my creatures die. I also feel like humility is one of those cards that allows your other play patterns to get a lot better because I feel like when you have a humility in play, the things that you're interacting with as far as counter magic is concerned is laser focused. At, at that point where there's a humility in play, you're really just trying to counter a force of vigor or a nature's claim because Rex Age doesn't deal with it. Um, I mean, Neoform doesn't really deal with it. There's a lot of cards that are no longer a threat to you. Um, it really lets you pick and choose your battles much more cleanly after that. Yeah, it, it definitely lets me kind of sit there and go, okay, now I can focus and not have to worry about the creature aspects, and I can focus on the non-creatures, which majority is how people deal with them, with, with uh, humility and stuff like that. We have the tried and true Ice Crown Scepter Dramatic Reversal combo. Uh, falls along the same lines with the Polymorph uh, lines. You generate infinite mana. You untap Shorakai a bunch. Draw into Blind Obedience. Cast Blind Obedience and Blind Obedience X toward everybody. Uh, there's also a neat. There's two neat interactions. Uh, I am running Copy Artifact in the list, so you could do Copy Artifact and Swan Song to make infinite swans. Uh, if for some reason your blind obedience is gone, uh, you can also do a build your own dramatic reversal. If for some reason something weird happened where your ice crown scepter imprinted a Narset's reversal, and what you do is you uh, cast dramatic Scepter, a dramatic reversal, Narset's reversal, your dramatic reversal, and keep repeating. Probably my final and favorite combo in the deck, uh, mainly because of the way that I figured it out, uh, is the intuition line involving Dermotaxi, Savine's Reclamation, and whether it be Tidespout Tyrant or Hole Breacher. Hole Breacher is obviously the better one here, but, you know, here we are. <laughs> I actually, the night before the uh, one tournament I went to out in New York, I took a nap, and I had a dream that I literally cast this thing. I cast this combo. It was not in my deck at all. And I woke up, and I called up Y, and I called up Cypher, and I said, hey, I'm running this. This is what I'm doing. Here's what it does, because Dermotaxi, uh, when it enters the battlefield, has the imprint trigger. As it enters the battlefield, exile a creature card from your graveyard, and then you can tap two untapped creatures you control until the end of turn. Dermotax becomes a copy of the exile card, except as a vehicle artifact in addition to its other, other types. So it literally just becomes a copy of the Tyrant or the Hole Breacher. And then you proceed to do the, the Polymorph Lines with the looping of the uh, Mana Positive Rock and then Shorakai, and then you're off to the races. Yeah, it's, it's always fun to discover another intuition pile. It's just, it's never not satisfying. So so in terms of combo order, would you say Polymorph's kind of your initial game plan, and then which which which, which uh, combo do we typically fall back on next? Is it typically Isorev, or, or where are we going if, if we're not polymorphing this game? So it really depends on the table structure. Um, if I'm having a stack deck at the table, I'm usually following uh, going polymorph into humility uh if i'm falling you know if i'm going trying to go fast this simple and cleanest way is polymorph and ice crown scepter uh and then the humility is the backup uh, i depend it really is table dependent to be quite honest polymorph seems to be always the front runner because it's the quickest and easiest and i'm sure your opening hand can dictate a few things too like if you have a humility you're probably just going to run it out and see if uh see if that sticks Absolutely, because humility becomes a need to answer threat. Speaking of threats, here's how we deal with them. That was a terrible segue, but I'll take it. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the removal that we have in here. Um, you obviously have counter spells. It's you're in blue. 
obviously have counter spells. Uh, one of the more unique counter spells that I get to run, though, being I'm under these restrictions, is Spell Snare, which is one blue mana, and you counter target spell with converted mana cost two. So, hey, Tain Impact, hey, that's his Oracle, um, hey, Underworld Breach, Dockside Extortionist, just straight up counter those. Doesn't matter, and the cool thing is it can't be deflecting Swat it, which is why I really wanted to run it. Uh, I also get to run things like I mentioned before, Narcissus Reversal, uh, another cool one is Mind Break Trap, um, but it's really the pretty much standard, you know, blue counter spells. But going off that, I would say, like, it's standard blue counter spells plus two or plus three, because like we mentioned before, you're not running those creature slots, so you have an expanded pool of all your other strengths. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not running counter spells like Hinder or sp uh, Spell Crumple, but like I get to run neat things like Spell Snare or Narcissus Reversal. Yeah. Probably the my favorite reason that even attracted me to Shorakai was the fact that I get to run board wipes. Uh, I tried running a ton of board wipes. I tried running one board wipe. Um, finally, what I settled on was three. Uh, Supreme Verdict. What's great about destroying all creatures is a lot of the decks and a lot of the meta that I've noticed seems to go towards creature based. Uh, decks like Winota, Yuriko, um, anything that runs any type of farm deck seems to run around creatures. And if you get rid of their creatures, well, they are super on the back foot and they can't do much at all. They have to rebuild and they have to spend time to rebuild. Meanwhile, you're still built, which means that puts you effectively two turns ahead or more depending on how developed they were, they were. If you make two people rebuild at sorcery speed for something like five mana a piece, then um, you have time to, if you are behind on your commander, you can deploy your commander in that opening. You can be holding up counter magic in that opening. You can be deploying a humility after after they tap out to recast. I feel like you get the door uh, open very wide for you at that point. And very few people are playing around board wipes in this day and age. Shorakai is one of the few, I would say, like prominent new decks that is on the board wipe strategy. Uh, I think Toxic Deluge has kind of fallen out of favor in a, a general sense. I mean, there are still decks that play it, but um, at least locally, there's there's fewer Toxic Deluge decks. We're leaning more toward fast combo. If you're running more toward Adnaz, you're not really thinking about it. Um, and I think we could be, you know, possibly looping back around to having a really good merit to Toxic Deluge, Fire Covenant. Obviously, in terms of Shorakai, those aren't in your colors, so like Supreme Verdict. Um, you're also playing a very fun one, Vanquish the Horde. Do you want to mention that one quick? Yeah, that's what I was going into next. Uh, Vanquish the Horde, it's six, white, white. And it spell, it, this spell costs one less for each creature on the battlefield, and it just straight up destroys all creatures. Uh, it's kind of equivalent to Blasphemous Act in red. Uh, except it's double white and costs six. But the thing is, you don't really care about your creatures. Like, the, you just make more. And the cool thing is, being able to make more, they count towards your cost reduction on Vanquish the Horde. And sometimes people are like, oh yeah, he just has double white, it's cool. And you're like, alright, cool, I'm going to Vanquish the Horde. And you wipe the board, and you're like, alright, cool, I'm going to make another pilot. And call it a day. Uh, and you, another card that we get to run in the lands um, that's, I'm going to say, honorable mention board wipe, Tabernacle of Pendril Veil. Uh, you get to, it makes every creature have an upkeep cost of one. And you're just like, yep, cool, my creatures die, my pilots die, that's okay. But somebody who has like a Timna or a Najila or something like that, they're really going to sit there and, and really consider making, paying that extra one. And that could, make or break the turn or their game. Uh, one of the final board wipes that we have here is Cyclonic Rift. It's a pretty tried and true card that's been around for ages now. You know, it's bounce all your stuff at instant speed. Cool, great. The cool thing about that one is it gets rid of everything on your opponent's side and your stuff is not affected. That's the biggest thing with that. Uh, then we go into some targeted removal. Uh, Swords, Plowshares, White Staple, Path to Exile. On the fringe, you know, but still pretty good because guess what? A lot of people don't run basics nowadays. But I'm looking at it in the G-Law, I'm going, you're definitely not running the basic. 
get that out of here. Uh, one of the unique ones is Resculpt, which lets me get rid of an artifact or a creature, which, when we talked about earlier, one of my fears is Null Rod, and Null Rod effects, that deals with both Null Rod and also Collector Roof. So that's great for me. Uh, and then you have Windsor Rebuke, which is great because it just bounces an online permanent and everybody mills. So top deck tutors don't have to worry about them anymore. So, so one of the questions that I had in the removal suite, and I'm, I'm sure this was considered and, and why it's not being played, why the um, hold up on playing March of Otherworldly Light? Seems like that answers Null Rods, Collector Roofs, and other things that you're scared of. So I tried it. I tested it multiple times. Uh, my biggest holdup for that is the amount of white permanents I'm actually running. Uh, white cards I'm actually running, I should say. Um, it's not as many as you would think. It's only nine cards. So, yes, I could dump a bunch of mana into there and do it that way. But it really get like, if I'm paying three mana for to remove a Null Rod or a Collector Oof, it's like, why? Like, if I would much rather be running the Sorcery Speed uh, Prismatic Ending as opposed to that just to deal the same effect. But the thing is also, all my white cards, I want them. Like, I don't want to pitch a Savine's or an Angel's Grace or a Blind Obedience to March of All the Worldly Light. I'm like, okay, I'll just play around it for now. Or, I could deal with it on the stack. Which, one of the ways to deal with it on the stack is, naturally, counter spells. Wow, go figure, I'm in blue. I never would have guessed that one. Uh, some other interesting things that I get to run, like I was talking those silver bullets, uh, Dress Down. And this is one of my favorite cards that's come out recently because it's a mini humility kind of thing. Uh, it's one in a blue. It has flash. When it enters the battlefield, it, you draw a card, which it replaces itself, which is great. Uh, and it says creatures lose all abilities. And then at the beginning of the, the end step, sacrifice Dress Down. So if someone's about to combo out with uh, Thousand's Oracle, you go, cool, I'm going to Dress Down. It's great. And another card that kind of deals with Thassa's Oracle and other things like that is uh, Angel's Grace. That's an interesting include. Typically you see that paired with, uh, well, old school, but back in the day you saw that always paired with Ad Nauseam to allow you to draw your deck and go for the win. So so here it's mainly just used as a uh, protection effect against scary things. Yeah, it's I use it more defensively. Same thing with Silence, actually. I could use it offensively when I'm trying to combo out, but a lot of times Silence would just end up as a, um, hey, you're about to combo out with Breach, cool, don't do that. Same thing with Angel's Race. It's like, all right, cool, yeah, you can do your Breach lines, that's perfectly fine. You know, I'm just gonna, how about no? <laughs> I feel like the control aspect of Shorakai really opens up those options for Silence on a game-to-game -game basis versus, like, you're not doing it as last resort. It's fully on the table doing it defensively. Yeah, and I run Time Twister in here to reset everything if I use it defensively, and then later on I can use it offensively. What what, what really kind of interested me a lot about Angel's Grace overall um, was when you first mentioned it, I thought you were an insane person. Um, but if you really think about it, there's there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of effects and ways to win the game anymore that are that are li library dependent, right? You know, Thassa's Oracle, Demonic Consultation, Breach, in Underworld Breach into like Brain Freeze slash Grinding Station loops and different things like that. So there actually is a little bit more of a, re of a prevalence to, you know, have that type of effect in your deck more so than, than I think. I'm still kind of on the fence on it personally, but overall I think it's a, there's, there's some merit there to having that card in your deck and I think it's pretty cool. And it definitely has the gotcha moments, which is, which is, you know, you know, clip worthy when they happen. Yeah. Hashtag mom clip this. So speaking of mom, some of the things that mom used to do for us, she used to tutor us. And there's a lot of tutors in this deck. Uh, the most prominent tutors are the ones that tutor to the battlefield. Uh, those are the most important tutors. So Word of Invention, Reshape, Polymorph, I, and Proteus stuff. I technically consider them a tutor. Transmute Artifact. Those ones, because they tutor them right to the battlefield, are more important than the other ones. Um, because they can just, okay, I'm going to do this in the game. You know, I can, if I have dramatic reversal in my hand and I have a word of invention, 
I could go, cool, I'm going to word of invention for X equals 2, and then put an Ice Crown Scepter, imprint Dramatic Reversal, proceed to win. Uh, Tezzeret's another one that does the exact same thing, Tezzeret's a Seeker. Uh, and, you know, other neat, unique tutors is, because we don't have black in blue-white, obviously, um, so you get Transmute, like Muddle of Mixture, um, and Intuition, like I mentioned before, and Mystical Tutor and Lightning Tutor, they're all pretty much all right there so so in this topic there are actually two notable excludes i noticed that i wanted to kind of talk about really quick the one of them and it's it's in your maybe board um is the personal tutor i'm personally really a big fan of the card it gets you your polymorph which is like you were saying one of your main combos and as your backup like plan b for personal tutor it also lets you get a wrath of god a, a board wipe effect do you want to talk about the i don't know if you've if you've considered personal tutor a little bit more strongly lately so I did. I thought that it'd be halfway decent. I liked the idea of personal tutor. Uh, I just was more focused on not worrying about my own top deck tutors. Uh, it's the same reason I'm not a big fan of Imperial Seal. I, I just don't like it sitting there because I have its sorcery speed. I do it on my turn. I literally have to broadcast what I get. I'm literally just going, hey guys, um, I'm going to turn one personal tutor. I'm going to put the polymorph into my hand. Or in, onto the top of my library, not to my hand, I'm sorry. And I just sit there and go, well, I hope nobody has a Ragavan, uh, a uh, Windsor Rebuke, or anything that can mess up my top deck, you know, because it kind of messes up. And not only that, like, yeah, it could be right in my hand if I have Shorakai out, but it was always on the, it was the 101st card every time for me, to be quite honest. Yeah, that that's fair enough. Um... The other one that I was curious about, and I'm, I'm going to go a little bit farther with this question. Um, I'm curious about how viable you think Teleria West might be in this deck, because you're able to transmute for a zero drop. Looking at your list, I, I, I feel that the best targets for Teleria West transmute would be your Tabernacle and possibly your Jewel Lotus. So I guess like the actual question here is, how valuable are Tabernacle and or Jeweled Lotus on an average game to you to make Teleri West maybe a consideration, maybe not a consideration. They're just really nice. It's it's gravy, baby, if I have them. It's not like I don't need them to function. You know, it's not I have to sit there and, oh, God, I didn't get my tabernacle this game. I'm completely screwed over. Or I'm completely shut off or, you know, because there's other times that tabernacle is just it's a dead card sometimes because, oh, some other people are not playing uh, creature-centric decks. So it's like, okay, well, now I just have a effectively an enchantment that does nothing, even though it's a land. You know, if somebody has like an Urborg or a uh, Yavimaya, that's great. That makes it so much better. Um, but sometimes, like, I'm actually looking to draw into Tabernacle more often than I'd like to see it in my opening hand. I was about to say, so like, so what you're saying is that they're nice bonus cards to progress a game plan that you're already trying to work toward. Absolutely. Like, Jeweled Lotus, I am ecstatic to see my open hand, because that's a turn one Shorakai. You know, but Tabernacle, I'm like, if I had Tabernacle and Jeweled Lotus, yeah, no, I would not be happy to have both of them in my hand at one time. Jeweled Lotus, I'm never disappointed to see, unless it's turn 10. You know, turn <laughs> turn 5 plus, I'm like, alright, and Shorakai's on the field, I'm like, well, this kind of sinks. But the other bonus of Jeweled Lotus is it's a zero-drop artifact that could start my Tide Spout chain. The, the the weird thing with the Jeweled Lotus as the primary target with the Teleria West is, if I remember correctly, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but the transmute on Teleria West is three. So, like, if you're transmuting for Jeweled Lotus, you're already, like, one mana away from having the Shorakai anyway. So if you have, like, Teleria West for Jeweled Lotus, play the Jeweled Lotus, crack it, tap a mana, play the Shorakai, you probably could have already just played the Shorakai there. So, like, it's, like, kind of awkward in that in that sense. If it was, like, two or one for the transmute i would probably be more of a fan of it myself but like that's what's awesome. yeah if it was actually like a functional ritual effect that makes sense correct but you're really you're really just like not you're, you're still gonna have the shorakai the next turn it's it's somewhat of a consideration in the sense that it can get you something to start your hole breaker horror chain but again like you probably should already kind of be there at that point yeah it sounds like Tulare west is fetching you your um your plan b's and plan c's and not your plan a's yeah, exactly. That that's what they do. They they more or less uh, fetch me my ramp, um, which <laughs> go figure. We're blue white. We're mana rock dependent. 
Like, it's an artifact-based deck. We need all the ramp we could get. Uh, one of the cards that actually is unique, and I get to run it in, in Shorakai, uh, is Manifold Key, which lets me untap an artifact. And it also gives me the opportunity to make a creature unblockable this turn, which could be used um, to make deals with the table, to be quite honest. Because you're like, hey, I need you to get in with that, you know, whatever to deal damage to this person, so the Ragavan, to get rid of their top deck tutor that they did, I'm going to make it unblockable for you. But also it just, hey, my mana vault's tapped, I want to generate five, uh, five mana this turn. Cool. You know, you just tap mana vault, tap mana full key, untap, do your thing. You know, it's a great ramp piece in this set, in this option. And also untap Shorakai, so you can keep looting. Yeah, I mean, that I thought that was maybe an understanding, but uh, yeah, no. It lets me untap Shorakai. Moving on to kind of like the silver bullets that we have here, and some unique cards for Shorakai is so, I mentioned always having a fear. This fear is Null Rod. Well, the other fears are Curse Total, in my opinion, Curse Total Effects, Torpor of Effects, uh, anything of the sort like that, that stop people from doing their game plan, or progressing their game plan, like Grafty, well, Grafty's Cage kind of hurts me, but you know, that's besides the point uh, but this deck gets to run all of those so i get to run curse to and i don't care it doesn't bother me because even dermo taxi it's an artifact you know torp orb i have no etb creatures great unwinding clock is phenomenal because it's on the same level of manifold key i get to untap shorakai and progress my board state and make moves and have protection up it's like having a seed board muse but just for artifacts imposter mech i mentioned before um, how powerful that could be in Dermotaxi because of its unique strategy because it's also um, it's a graveyard it's not just my graveyard so if somebody has something really interesting in their graveyard that I want I just go yeah I'm going to take that that's imprinted on Der Dermotaxi yeah yeah. There, there are some definite silver bullets in here I, I really like Unwinding Clock like we, we talked about earlier like uh, having access to untap and, and do that again having that, that ability to have a seedborn muse for your artifacts is is pretty great. I mean, being able to, you know, effectively draw what two, four, six, eight cards in a turn cycle, um, never, never a bad moment there to be. And then having to be, like we said, being more of a control deck and a, and a reactive deck to stuff, having the mana on each turn to do that's 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 pretty strong, um, in in and of itself there to to kind of go through those motions. He who he who spends more mana and draws and plays more cards usually ends up winning the game. So. Yeah, so cards like Unwinding Clock and Manifold Key to let me draw more cards and spend my mana more efficiently lets me play more cards, which usually leads to me winning the game more often. So, guys, what do you guys think? What, what do you, I, know, I know this has been, like, my brainchild for a while. I know I've asked you guys multiple times. Um, what do you guys think? What, what, are, what are your thoughts on it? You heard my thoughts. What about me? What about you guys? Not me. So I like your initial takes on Shorakai. I think that you're kind of like, I mean, you're leading this discussion because you're the pioneer on it, I think, more than the other two of us. Um, I like a lot of the avenues that you've explored. And I feel like if this is a deck that I built and, and shuffled up tomorrow in a tournament, um, I might want to lean more into the... Um, I guess either one or the other, like either the polymorph aspect or the stacks aspect of the deck. And I'm honestly, I'm leading toward the polymorph aspect. I feel that this is an excellent polymorph deck, um, especially being in blue white. Uh, I feel that you can tutor up your polymorph very effectively. I just want to lean harder into the polymorph, I'll be honest, because even if you aren't doing a fast combo, I really appreciate the extra additional value of Shorakai. Obviously, you get to draw two, discard one. You get to constantly be churning your hand as well as going plus one on card advantage every time you activate. Um, but also, you're getting a chump blocker that if you go unopposed for a turn cycle, you can potentially be uh, in contention for having a commanding board position, especially if there's like a something like an Ajila in your pod or a Timna in your pod. That only has two toughness. You just make two tokens and you have a safe board position to go with your other angles. So I I personally like getting a bit leaner on the combo train. Um, I still like the board wipes. I still like a lot of your counter magic. 
And I think I would go harder into the polymorph lines if possible. How so? Like, what would you add? I mean, I'm I'm a big fan of personal tutor uh, cards like that. I think are a good option. Um, and what do we have? Like, is is Tezra in the deck right now? Yeah, it is. Right. Yeah, Tezra's in the deck. Yeah. So I mean, more ways. If there are more ways to fetch up an Iso Scepter, or if there are more ways to fetch up an Iso Scepter or a Prote Staff, I feel that that could be worth considering. Other ways of getting a Polymorph out. Uh, I I just think that you have a lot of defense and I feel that you have the freedom to put a few cards into the offensive category, just shift a few over, um, make it a little bit more aggressive just because if you're in a more aggressive pod, sometimes you can't afford to set up your stacks pieces. And in those situations, you'll be happy that you have some more options to kind of put your foot on the gas when you need to. That's just my personal preference. That's my personal play style. I like that flexibility. It's not for everyone, but that's definitely my take. Yeah, and that's completely viable. Like I, I did try the more lean in heavily into polymorph with cards like long term plans, uh, another tutor. Uh, I even tried drift of phantasms at one point to tutor up the Proteus staff a lot easier. Um, I personally my play style again i like to play the long game i'm a stacks player at heart i love to play control and this gets to fill all of those roles and me taking the long game and taking you know i'm going to use you in the general sense taking you out of the your game plan of comboing out turn one two three and me going no no no, we're going to play at my pace and we're going to play until turn six turn seven it completely messes with that player's mental which this is, this is a mental game at the end of the day. And I'd rather mess with their mental and break their, you know, normal, okay, yep, cool, uh, the old the old Flash uh, flash Hulk, I win, please play it out, and they don't know how to play it out type adage thing. You know, that's I'd rather do that than go for the speed. I thought you were just going to say break their wills. I'm like, all right, calm down. I mean, yeah, I'm not running Will Breaker because it's a polymorph deck, but, you know, that'd be something I would do. I guess for me, um, I kind of look, when I look at the deck, I kind of have two different avenues I want to take it. Um, to piggyback off of uh, off of why, uh, I, I do like kind of going more in on the combo. I do like adding things like, you know, personal tutor to get, the, get it to the top of the deck. I actually like, um, since you can't play creatures, like an effect I would really like on a combo turn would be something like a Grand Abolisher. So I was really interested in like the little Teferi Teferi... Um, Time Raveler, um, because it, it gives you that level of like, all right, shut up, it's my turn, no one can do anything um, on my combo turn to, you know, kind of guarantee that that, that, that uh, polymorph happens there um, in, in interesting lines and into that place. So I would look to probably cut some of the fluff um, and, and just go a little harder in, in trying to set up the, the poly tyrant line um, was this one way. Um, but in order to be a little different, um, another line that I'm interested in is this is a very low to the ground, two color deck. Um, and you have lands like Tabernacle that doesn't even tap for mana or do anything. So I would be really interested in, in transitioning um, into uh, more of a control deck. I still don't like stacks, but uh, uh, back to basics lines and um, are really interesting to me. Being able to effectively shut off people's mana as well to continue to to expedite because again most of your mana is coming from your mana rocks anyways. Um, so just being able to to take out a, another person's mana, um, sort of combat the null rod effects in the collector use. Right, if someone's going to slam those, well then slam them back to basics and, and and tell them to shut up too for a while. Um, if they're in a multicolor deck, that is, um, and then something like uh, like a Narset to prevent people from trying to to, to continue to dig, um, because you know if you have a Narset in play and can protect it with your pilots, well, you're drawing again, you know, upwards of at least five ish cards in a given turn cycle sometimes um, for something like that, and then they're they're restricted to one, so you have a much easier time of kind of using your one for one removal or your two for ones from your board wipes to just continue to, to just overwhelm the table with advantage. I think that would be an interesting way to um, to to kind of shift the deck a little bit differently if you wanted to adjust to that level of, of play style there, where you, you can just kind of kind of shut the door. Plus, Narset obviously is a great cantrip to help dig for stuff. Yeah, 
No, absolutely. I, I That is something I definitely considered when I was building it. Um, I ran through it multiple times. I mean, I had so many different iterations. I mean, if you look at my sideboard and my considering pile, it's silly how many cards that have been gone in and out of this deck. Um, I originally started with the full-on hard stacks deck, and I was like, it just doesn't feel right. It just didn't do enough as a straight stacks deck. And that's when I ended up settling on the fast combo. Or I'm sorry, the polymorph train. And that let me play a lot different. Um, one of the notable excludes that some people like to see in this type of uh, one, I, I've noticed in a couple other decks that we're going to mention next, uh, is like Skull Clamp and stuff like that. And I didn't like it. I, I mean, yeah, it got let me use my pilots to um, draw two cards off them, but I would just rather have my pilots as blockers because... Timnas are a thing, Najilas are a thing, and, and like Y said, they only have two toughness, and pilots have one power. You get two of them, they ain't attacking you. Not at all. Yeah, that's just me, though. That says one mana draw two cards. I'm, I'm all in for that every single day. I, am, I, w- I wouldn't pass that up. I would 100% be on Skull Clamp, but I understand the reasons why. I feel like Skull Clamp is like the, the Thrasios uh, parallel, and you were very more on the... Um kind of like the control plan and not really the mid-range plan just as a whole cork um it definitely your list plays to your preferences very much and i feel like if you're transitioning from a thrasios based value deck or a timna based value deck then the skull clamp inclusion makes more sense for you absolutely so there's a couple deck lists this deck still hasn't been put on the main database it's still in the brewer's corner um and i kind of Looked up, looked at them. You know, this was, I built this before they were on there, not to be like hipster me, but um, they just recently came onto the Brewer's Corner in the last update, I believe. Um, they haven't been made to the main one yet, but uh, I did, you know, Moxiel has that wonderful compare feature, and I was able to compare, and I'm about 20 some odd cards off of the two that are on the database. Uh, and a lot of them are personal preferences uh, versus. And a lot, uh, you know, what's in there, and two of them that are also in there are running the uh, one of them is only running one tyrant, uh, and a lot of it has to do with lands, which is odd, you know. Um, some of them are running the flip lands and more basics, uh, running a windfall, for instance. Um, kind of unique, and I mean, these are definitely things that I consider one of the ones that I saw in the uh. They get in the Eva Shinji deck list by Kazu and Whimsy is one of my favorite cards out of time. Uh, I just love the idea of that card. I tried it, and that was when I had a bunch of board wipes. Would I play it over Vanquish the Horde? Maybe. Um, I like Vanquish the Horde because it just deals with the threats, whereas uh, Out of Time kind of just temporarily does it. But the cool thing about, about Out of Time is it phases them out. So that's a slightly more important in, in its certain sense, at a certain level, I should say. Uh, because Vanguard Sword lets you put your Najila or your Timna back in your command zone. Out of time, just says, uh uh-uh, they're just staying here. But enough of me talking. What do we say for some uh, sample hands? Let's let's get into the nitty-gritty of this, huh? Sure, let's dig in. Let's see what kind of hands and see how your mulligan decisions will, will affect kind of how this deck plays out. So the first hand we have here going is we have Swamp Song. Arid Mesa, an offer you cannot refuse. Command Tower, Spire of Industry, Torpor Orb, and an Urza's Saga. So right away, I don't like this hand. Uh, I don't have any fast mana, number one. I do have stuff to do on each turn. Uh, turn one, I can leave a Valfur or Swan Song. Turn two, I can play Torpor Orb. Um, obviously, turn one play would be the Urza Saga, so that on turn three, I can easily get a Mana Crypt, a Soul Ring, which you want to get the Soul Ring. Um, but it also depends on uh, table position and uh, who I'm facing against. Because this deck really wants to mulligan aggressively depending on who you're playing. Um, but I would, like, first glance, I saw it, I looked, I went, nah, ship it. Yeah, I feel like if you have room to breathe in your pod, then maybe you keep this because you have an Urza Saga that lets you get some guaranteed value that's uncounterable. Uh, maybe get a token out of it. But yeah, I think I think in most pods, I agree with the Mulligan. 
Yeah, it's it's close, right? Because you do get that you do get that guarantee of the turn three, turn three, yeah, turn three short guy, but that's a little slow for me. So I would probably ship. Let's see what we get next. So going down to second seven, we have Torpor Orb again, Resculpt, Basic Planes, Minamo, Swan Song, Chromox, and Gemstone Caverns. So since we have a Gemstone Caverns in our hand, let's talk about this both uh, going first as well as going uh, later on in the pod. So going first, this is a ship. Going anything other than first, I'd keep this. Uh, reason I'd keep this is it's a turn two Shorakai, uh, but it also is a turn one either Resculpt or Torpor Orb, um, depending again on what you're facing. Uh, and you get to leap up, you know, something like Swan Song for backup or, you know, anything like that. So since this is a complex hand, walk me through your going second. What are you pitching to Gemstone? What are you pitching to Chrome Mox? So right away, since I know that... All right, so can we get a draw then? No. No? All right, cool. So that's perfectly fine. So turn one, 100%, uh, I would play Gemstone. The first pitch would be actually Swan Song. And I'd play the uh, Minamo and leave up re Resculpt. Or leave, you know, I eh, yeah, I'd leave up Resculpt. I actually wouldn't play the Chrome Box. So you're so you're in Swan Song. Yeah. You wouldn't you you yeah. So you're gem, Gemstone Planes Pass. Or are you playing the Chrome Box? Uh, I wouldn't play the Chrome Box. I would play. wait on the Chrome Box. Yeah. Neat. Why? What about you? Uh, I like the idea of Gemstone pitching. Uh, potentially resculpt. I think that's pod dependent. Um, if you're seeing a fast combo, maybe you pitch the uh, the resculpt and keep Swan Song. If you're expecting a lot of uh, mid range creature like a Chrom deck, maybe you pitch the Swan Song, keep resculpt. Um, I do like the idea of a turn one torpor orb, but I could also see merit to. Well, you're getting you're getting the turn one torpor orb anyway, right? Because you're doing gemstone caverns plus land drop. And I feel that you don't necessarily have to do Chromox on turn one. Depending on what your first draw step is, maybe you wait to to your second draw step into your Shorakai turn to see what you're pitching to Chromox and see how that develops. Yeah, that's my thought. So, and I'm going to let you a little insight from me playing it. Resculpt has been one of the most important interaction slash removal pieces that I have ever had in this deck because it's able to get rid of artifacts or creatures. That's why I prioritized, when I, when I was talking about pitching this one song to the Gemstone Caverns, that's why I said that instead of the Resculpt. You mentioned at the very beginning of the episode, uh, your, one of your greatest fears is a Collector Oof effect or a Null Rod effect. Resculpt definitely answers both of those things. So I feel like if you're expecting either of those, you hold on to the Resculpt for dear life. Literally dear life. <laughs> Sounds like that's a good second seven. All right. Uh, on the draw, not the play. The play, this is an easy pick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Play, play, and this is definitely ship it back. All right. Let's do a next seven. Fresh seven, boys and girls. So this one is Windswept Heath, Tundra, Imposter Mech, Polymorph, Silence, Island, and a Mox Opal. So I really wanted this to be good. I, I saw the first three cards, and I'm like, oh, this is great. I love it. And I saw Polymorph. I'm like, we're getting there. Silence, ooh, baby, getting closer. And then Island Mox Opal, and I'm like, never mind. Uh, it does nothing. It, it literally doesn't do anything. Um, if that Mox Opal was a Mana Crypt, absolutely. If that Mox Opal was a Soul Ring, absolutely. Anything that got me two mana there, if that was a Jewel Lotus, I'd probably keep it too. A uh, potential question here. Are there any commanders off the top of your head that would let you keep this hand? Seeing that you have an imposter mech in hand, are there any um, known creatures that you might keep this hand based off of? Um, if I'm thinking just commanders and only commanders, yeah, like like guaranteed cards, I guess I could I could say. Like Thrasios is nice with imposter mech. Uh, Seedborn Muse is amazing with imposter mech. It's not a but it, it, that's what I mean. It's not a commander. I'm more looking for the cards in their deck or potentially in their deck than I am the actual commanders. Like, if there was one commander, it, it'd be... Um, actually, no. That's a lie. There are two commanders that I could think of off the top of my head. Krom? Um, nope. I actually don't really... Krom's meh for me. Like, that's fair. It, uh, 
Prosper, Combound, and Thrasios are probably the two that I would be like, okay, Krom's up there, like it's good. It, I'd actually put on the same level of um, same level of Thrasios. Like, pro, if I see a, see a Prosper, Prosper, I'm all about that because getting to generate a mana and getting an extra card draw effect is phenomenal. But either way, this is, in my personal opinion, this is definitely a pinch. Yeah, not quite there. That makes sense. Yeah, I don't like this hand at all. This is worse than the hand with the Ears of Saga, and that one was, was bad. All right, next seven. Second seven. Uh, this one's crap. Uh, it, maybe not. I didn't see the other line. Uh, Unwinding Clock, Dovin's Veto, Misty Rainforest, Cyclonic Rift, Academy Runes, Force of Will, and Teferi, Master of Time. Your assessment was correct. This is crap. It is crap. I, I I only saw the Academy runes at first, and I was like, oh yeah, this hands garbage. But then I was like, oh, there's a Misty in here. Maybe not, but no, it's bad. Yeah, 100% shipping back. There's not a world where I keep this. Let's go to six. Dovin's Veto, Supreme Verdict, Polluted Delta, Flusterstorm, Academy runes, Swan Song, and Vanquish the Horde. Whoa, five's looking great. Yeah, um, if that Academy runes was a either another fetch land or anything... I'd consider it, depending on my pod, because of having the Fluster Storm and the Swan Song and the Veto and the Vanquish Award. Um, I think if it, was, if it was like a fetch land, yeah, because then you can go like like turn one, keep up the Swan Song, turn two, Dovin's Veto, turn three, like potentially have Vanquish the Horde at the ready. But like, ooh. Yeah, 100%. I feel like if there's a Najila or two mana dork decks in your pod, the Vanquish the Horde makes this very um, possibly enticing, but that's a very specific situation. Yeah, uh, no, down, I agree with that. Down to five. We might be really mulliganing here today, everybody. Uh, Angel's Grace, Talisman of Progress, Winds of Rebuke, Intuition, The Tabernacle at Pendril Vale, Spire of Industry, and Dovin's Veto. So before we get Cork's thoughts on this, the interesting note is Technically a one land hand, um, but we are in five, so I'm curious to see if Tabernacle sways his opinion on having that depend obviously pod dependent, but sways his decision making there. Uh nope. Because Tabernacle would be one of, if I was to keep this hand, Tabernacle would be one of the cards I put back. Uh this card is a big no for me. All right, we're going down all the way to four. All right, on four, we have Swan Song, Dress Down, Time Twister, Mox Diamond, Urza Saga, Proteus Staff, and an offer you can't refuse. What's hilarious, listeners, is in typical Quark fashion, he doesn't play lands in his deck. Naturally, and I'm actually running 30 in this list. Um, you going to keep a one land Mox Diamond hand on four? Actually, this hand has the best possible option of doing something. I know that sounds weird, but hear me out. Trying to jam the twister. Correct. <laughs> you literally you, saga you, box diamond twister hold keep offer or try and do something. Exactly. Like my my keepable four is I'd actually probably keep this hand in all honesty. Uh it'd be Urza Saga, Mox Diamond, Time Twister, and an offer you can't resist. Sucks as if the saga was blue, you could oh wait, actually you could turn you could turn one twist. No, wait. Eh, eh, no, you can't. Never mind. I, I, I was thinking the same thing you're thinking, Cypher, in that if you have a blue land, you can counter your Mox Diamond for two treasures. Yep. 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 If that, if that saga was blue, you could turn one Twister with his hand. That's neat. But yeah, it's just, that was my first thought. I'm like, how do I get Twister Man? I'm like, ooh, Offer does it. And I'm like, oh, crap, the Diamond. No. But, it's still a turn two Twister, but yeah. Maybe. Well, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, like, if in your thought process, like, because if the year of the saga was blue, if it was an island, you know, you cast the yeah, Mox yeah, Diamond, yeah, yeah, you yeah, offer yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, no, I get it. Like I said, I was just trying to think of. I was trying to, to to blitz it, but yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a way there to get. But yeah, nope. Yeah, Urza Saga is a is a nice door opener. I mean, considering the fact that you're on what a a four card opener on this, I think Ur- Urza Saga gives you an ability to actually play the game. Yeah, that's that's all reason. Honestly, I would like, absolutely keep this as well. By the way, uh, I I'm I'm actually torn between. I'm definitely keeping Twister Diamond and Saga. I'm debating that if I want Offer or Swan Song. Dress Down's enticing as well, but I, I probably would just keep the Offer because I, I kind of want the mana then at some point. So yeah, it's probably, it's probably Offer. Yeah, no, it's Offer because it's it's a non-creature counter spell, period. No, it, there's no conditions, not like Swan Song with an enchantment, instant, or sorcery. Like So if there's an artifact, if someone jams the Null Rod I, and I have a Swan Song, I go, well, I'm just completely screwed out of this game. But if someone jams the Null Rod with an Offer, I go, yeah, all right, you can have your two treasures. 
in this hand, I'm legitimately looking at it as a ritual, right? I, I want to draw a blue pip. I want to cast the blue pip. I want to mox di- play the mox diamond, counter it, and get my twister going. Exactly. That's, that's, that's Start over. Plan. All right. Uh, let's do one or two more here. This hand, we found the lands. We have a Mana Vault, a Seagate Restoration, Academy Runes, Island, Dramatic Reversal, Ancient Tomb, and Unwinding Clock. Is this a keep Seagate Restoration hand, or a cast Seagate Restoration hand? Uh, possibly. So this is uh, my, my one. one blue, though. <laughs> this is a turn one Unwinding Clock, which I actually really like, because it involves a Mana Vault, which means that depending on what my next couple draws are, I can easily cast Shorakai. I don't know. I, I'm not into this hand at all. It's got one blue pit ball. I guess it's got two, technically, if you're casting, playing the Seagate Restoration, but, like... Yeah, your hand's not doing anything besides playing a Mana Vault, and you, you can't even guarantee the cast of Shorakai. Yeah, no, that that's that's the one thing. Again, it's, like, it's fringe. It's so close. So I will audible to you, Cork. Is this a keep, or is this a second seven? Uh, knowing my way I play, I'd keep it. You're ridiculous. It's that low floor, high ceiling option that you love. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I'm going to break my golden rule. You drew a Wait. curse totem. Oh, yeah. The dream verdict. Your hand does nothing. No, <laughs> it does nothing. It can play a curse totem. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to point that out. The hand does nothing. Anyway. That's fine. <laughs> This one we have, so this would be a fresh seven because we kept that god awful hand. This one would be War of Invention, Adakar Wastes, Island, Talisman of Progress, Tide Spout Tyrant, Sensei's Divining Top, and an Arid Mesa. So effectively a mold of six because we have Tyrant in our hand. Yeah, I'd probably pitch this one. Uh, I mean, I get to play turn one top, turn two Talisman, but I don't get to take full effect of the top until at least turn three, turn four. It's a very sure. fair opening hand. Yeah, it's definitely... If I'm playing fair and balanced magic, this is a great hand. Because I also have enough to cast uh, Word and Mention as well. It's another weird hand where you're not, like, doing a lot. Like, you're going, what, turn one top, turn two talisman, turn three shorakai, and then, like, turn four is like, all right, now I'm ready to start playing magic, right? Like, the, I was t- I used four turns to develop. I don't know if I want to be doing that in, in CDH. I'm going second seven here. Agreed. Next seven, we have uh, Arzorius Signet, a Mox Opal, a Dermo Taxi, a Mana Drain, a Command Tower, and an Inventor's Fair. And thank God it's there, a uh, Basic Island. Yeah. <laughs> I'd 100% keep this one. Because I, I would I pause there because I looked and I was like, oh God, there's no double blue. This is crap. Now it's a little better. Yeah, no, th- this is one I would keep. Uh, it's a turn two Azurius Signet, turn three. Shorakai, which puts Mox Opal on that, which means I can activate Shorakai pretty easily. But what I like is you can pivot depending on the, the board, and you can hold up the Mana Drain and then get, get an explosion of mana through that as well, too, which would let you like, yeah. double spell onto like Signet, Opal, Shorakai, kind of in like one turn, which is kind of cool, too. So. Yeah, and what's also funny is that if I, for some reason, you know, I hold in uh, Dermo Taxi in my hand, and if I happen to just draw naturally a Tyrant effect, I could ditch it to Shorakai and start my changes naturally with Dermotaxi. I was going to say that, that this is in some ways also a hand of six by by nature of being a, a Dermotaxi in hand, same as having a Tide Spout Tyrant in your opener. Um, so, you know, given this, given the first seven cards you're seeing, this is probably the first card you might you might want to pitch to Shorakai activation. But if you do hit something along the way, one of your Tyrants, um, you have that really quick option. Um, you also have an option of possibly uh, mana draining an opponent's creature and then dermo taxiing that, right? Yeah, I like this. I like this on. I think this is a solid six. Is is, is to to wise point exactly. Um, I mean, it's got it's got a it's got an interaction piece. It's got some fast mana going on, decently fast mana, I guess. But o- overall, I, I'm I'm okay with this. This is our second seven, so I think I'm okay with that stopping. Yeah, it's a it's a comfortably keepable six, and then slightly more comfortably keepable seven. All right, let's do one more since y'all disagreed with my one that I kept. I don't know why I did. I'm assuming you did. I definitely did. I was like, you were insane, and I was point proven with the draws. I want to roll the dice, baby. 
This is not good, in my opinion. Uh, this is a Metal the Mixture, Academy Runes, War of Invention, Copy Artifact, Manifold Key, Mana Vault, and Savine's Reclamation. I'm going to ask you a question, Cork. Have you heard of blue and white mana? I was about to say, how many Academy Runes are in this deck? There's five, actually. I'm cheating. <laughs> uh, no, this is... Even though I can generate uh, five mana every time, which is cool and all, uh, every turn... No, I'll pass. Hey, once you start, once you start discarding the hand size, you can get your artifacts back. Maybe if you ever get a blue pip, I sure could. <laughs> All right, second seven. Oh my god, we might have a keeper, boys. Uh, this. Oh god, maybe not. I don't know. This one is a plains, a mystic remora, a flooded strand, a mana crypt, a mystic sanctuary, a mana vault, and a city of brass. So I'm going to ask the question on this one. You have a lot of mana and a fish. Are you comfortable with that? 100%. <laughs> this is a turn to Shorakai and still leaving fish up. Yep, this is a, this is a good one. Yeah, no, 100%. I, I don't care what position I'm in. I'm keeping this every time. Yeah, and Shorakai helps you, like like we were saying before, Shorakai helps you sculpt your hand. And an early Shorakai, um, I mean, that'll get rid of those excess lands, no problem. So, so here's a question um, I wanted to ask. Since this is turn turns or turn one, um, are, are you are you on hold sanctuary for as long as humanly possible, or are you are you kind of like trying to slam that quickly and get that and get it untapped? Is there is there a lot of value in that, or is it just kind of a card? Like, is that a card that I should be like play everything else but the sanctuary first, or or is that something that like I can? I can slam like let's say like the vault or the fish wasn't in the hand. Is it something you're slamming or are you are you holding onto that that sanctuary? Uh, I I have no problem slamming it if I need to. Um, it's neat. It's valuable. It's great. Like in this hand, it turn one literally looks in, in my vision that the turn one looks like this: flooded strand for tundra, uh, mana crypt, uh, tap crypt for mana vault, cast fish with the tundra, pass the turn. Uh, Turn two rolls around, use the crypt to pay for the, the fish, and then you play your planes, you tap Mana Vault the plane, uh, and the two lands, cast Shorakai, use the one floating for the Mana Vault to activate Shorakai. I've just gone five cards deep, four cards deep. And at this point, maybe you just discard the Mystic Sanctuary. Exactly. Correct. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to ask the question, since it came up in the deck, as to how important that card was in the deck. And Yeah, it's just a value card, right? Gets back counter spells, gets back stuff, but... It's not like it is in like something like a Tatiova deck where it's like a critical combo piece. Yeah, no, no, it's not like a. It's just an extra value card. In all honesty. All right, so uh, those are some of the hands. I hope those give a give give you guys some insights as to uh, kind of what you're looking for in the deck. Obviously, fast mana, right? Getting sure a Kai out early, and then having some some control elements, and um, play less academy runes and more uh, islands and planes in your deck list. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, five five Academy Runes is, uh, I found out, too much for the deck. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Quirk, I think that your deck building decisions are some really heads-up uh, analysis on what everything in the meta is trying to do right now. I think that Shorakai responds well to a lot of common things that we've been seeing a lot, especially the fact that I think creature decks feel a little bit too safe right now for some people, and Shorakai is there for that reality check that I think the meta might desperately need, depending on what your local meta might have. Um, so yeah, I just really appreciate that we're talking about Shorakai today, because I think it does something that a lot of decks are not right now. Thanks. It was labor of love. And ever since, like, um, Derevi and, and Korholm, like, I haven't really found, like, a deck that I've I vibed with as much as Shorakai. But yeah, link is going to be in the description. Uh, feel free Give it a test. Get it, play some, you know, locals. You know, do whatever you want to with it. You yeah, make changes. Feel free. Reach out to any one of us. We'll, you know, we'll definitely take a look. But we'll give you the feedback on what we like about that change, why we don't like that change. Um, coming up in the new set, there's not really many cards that I see that I want to add from it, to be quite honest. Uh, which the new set coming out is the Baldur's Gate one. Um, new Capena had, you know, I would love to put Ledger Shredder in there. But it had an offer you can't refuse, and that was pretty much the only card I wanted in there. Uh, otherwise, it's, eh, you know, I, I like the cards where I'm at. Yeah, new strong baseline. Plenty to build off of as new cards come out.
Just as a spoiler, uh, as a word of warning or caution, anybody who plays this deck, if you play it at the table, you will become that guy. So if you really want to be that guy, go ahead and play this deck and prepare to make people not happy with you as you prevent them from playing Magic. Oh, 100%. Uh, and the other thing that you got to watch out for, one of the biggest things is people are going to look at you and go, oh, you're playing blue-white. You have all the counter spells. Sometimes you don't. <laughs> and sometimes you got to be like, no, I really don't. Yeah sometimes, yeah, sometimes you have like a swords to plowshares and they're trying to like reach combo. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes your hand's a whole bunch of uh, colored pips and you have an academy runes in play, so. Oof. Hey, some, sometimes you're the hot dog and sometimes you're the bun. Anyways, guys, that's another episode of Commander and Coffee. We are done with the deck tech, and we are all out of coffee. So, Until next time, keep on brewing. <laughs>